Hello, fellow truth seekers. This is Barbara Jean. Uh, this is um, slightly different. <laughs> I reoriented re my computer to the other side of the, the desk, so it looks a little different. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it here on this side because I'm finding it difficult. I'm left-handed, so it, this would make more sense. But the problem I'm having I, this is really simple. It's a simple thing. I don't. I don't understand. I've been trying to use my left hand more because I'm having problems with my right hand doing using the cursor, you know, using the mouse. Um, and you would think that using a left-handed mouse would be easier, but since I've used my right hand for so long using the mouse, I'm, I'm completely dis discombobulated by using a left-handed mouse. But the problem I'm having is, is the cursor. I can't seem to re re turn the cursor from this angle into this angle, which would make much more sense to me since I'm trying to use my left hand using the cursor, I mean, using the mouse with my left hand. You'd think that I would have, you know, wouldn't be so difficult, but the problem I'm having is that the mouse is tilted the wrong direction. And so something so, so simple can cause so much problems. I mean, I'm really struggling. And I'm, I mean, going on, um, into my computer settings and trying to figure out if I can change the direction of the cursor because if I could do that it would make my life a whole lot easier but with it being tilted in the wrong direction it it throws me off anyway all that long explanation for nothing but so this is one of the reasons why I'm reordered reordered I put my computer over onto this side of the com of the desk but as it stands if I can't get used to it then I'm going to have to put it back but anyway in the meantime the reason i'm coming on right now is this is now um what's going on here this is now march 29th 2024 and i had an experience last night that i have to tell you about i I'm, i don't know what it was about but it was something big um let me just explain it um, it was a spiritual attack of some sort. It was some sort of spiritual attack. I think my last series of videos that I put out has really freaked out Satan, really freaked out the spirit realm, really freaked out the spirit realm. Okay. And uh, anyway, last night I had just finished dinner. I was I just made dinner. It was it wasn't something difficult. It was like get some. Made some um, cheese, um, chicken strips, and and the mashed potatoes and some salad. That was my dinner, and I had it about six thirty, six thirty, quarter to seven, something like that. So I ate my dinner, but while I was even before I went into eat, you know, make my dinner, I had this funny feeling, this feeling in, in the side of me that something, something wasn't quite right. Something wasn't quite right. But I made my dinner, sat down to eat my dinner, and as I was sitting, eating my dinner, I could I could already tell that my heart rate was high. It was it, it was something there was something stirring, okay. Um, um, those people who are spiritual and have had their heart stirred by God, you know what it feels like to have. One time I remember very clearly it was one of the most strangest feelings that I felt like I can't remember what happened now. It was an incident. I don't remember it now, but I do recall one time there was a very, I had a very unusual experience where it felt like someone had stuck their finger right into my chest, like stuck my finger in my chest and was stirring my heart like this. It was what the Bible talks about, you're stirring your heart. Well, this felt like someone had stuck their finger in my, and where they were, they were stirring my heart. It was the most bizarre thing. But anyway, I'm going up, I'm rambling. Um, but anyway, last night I was just, as I was eating my dinner, I knew something was not right. My heart felt different. Something was going on. I could feel that there was, my heart was starting to pound a little bit. And that usually is an indication that to me that something's happened in the spirit realm. Okay. Um, when I, so anyway, after I finished my dinner, I decided I needed to lie down because I had been up all day and, and actually quite early in the morning. Um, 
So it to work four o'clock in the morning, I was up. So I decided after dinner, I better lie down and see if I can get some rest. And uh, so I did. And I very quickly fell asleep. It didn't take long and I was asleep. And as I was sleeping, I think I must have slept for at least an hour, maybe longer, because it was around 9.30 when I woke up suddenly. I, I became aware that my heart wasn't just beating hard a little bit. It was starting to race and beat very, very hard. And the, the, the you know, of course, the presence of the Lord was always on, on my head. I could always feel Jesus touching my head. Always, he's always touching my head and, and doing something on top of my head. Anyway, so I, I, I at least had that comfort that the Lord hadn't, you know, wasn't, hadn't abandoned me, left me or forsaken me or anything like that. The Lord was with me. But my heart was pounding was starting to pound and pound and it was starting to race and it was beating so hard it felt like my whole body was shaking from the from the how hard my my heart was pounding my chest and it was going faster and faster and faster. I thought I I had my hand on my chest and I'm getting ready to panic so I'm getting ready to panic and I thought you know no Jesus is with me <laughs> so I'm not going to panic this is obviously something spiritual Although it feels pretty physical to me, it feels pretty physical, and it was darn night scary. And I thought, you know, no, Jesus is here. And if I and I said to I said out loud, I said, Jesus, am I going to die? Jesus, are you here? Jesus, you know, help me, help me. Am, am I going to die? And as because it was, it, I mean, I I was, boom, 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 boom. and so I was thinking. This could be it. I could be, I could be dying tonight. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to be afraid. If I die, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to just trust Jesus that this is, Jesus is here. He's with me. He knows what's going on. So I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him through this process because it's happened to me before. I have felt this before. I've gone through this a few times now, and he's always kept, helped me through it. He's always, he's always preserved me through this process. So, because, um, you know, in, in a way, it is a death. Whenever you are experiencing something like this, a panic, like a, almost like a panic attack, but um, I, I can't explain it. It is a panic attack, but it's also a spiritual attack. It's a spiritual attack. It's not just a panic attack. A fear, panic is fear. It's a spiritual attack. Satan is on some level attacking. And I could sense it. That's what my, my spirit was reacting to. Satan was was getting ready to do something. And he felt he had the reason, or he maybe he had some access because of fear. So therefore that door was open. So therefore, as I'm sitting there with this. My hand over my heart going, oh, I feel like oh, I'm going to die. I mean, I could still, I was breathing normal. I mean, that was the strangest thing. I wasn't oh, 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 hyperventilating like that, but I was just breathing normal. My heart was racing. It was pounding, but I was breathing normal. And so I thought to myself, this is a spiritual attack. This is a spiritual thing. So I thought, no, I'm going to let Jesus take care of this. If I perish, I perish, but I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to let Jesus take care of this. He is going to rescue me. So I thought, okay, this is going to go away. It's going to pass in a few minutes. It'll be done. So sure enough, after about 10 minutes, 10 minutes of this, boom, 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 boom. It was so violent. It was so violent. I truly, I, I thought, I was thinking to myself, I don't think my, my heart can handle this. This is such a violent attack. I don't think my heart can handle it. But I did. And after about 10 minutes of this strange experience, it I, almost immediately, it just kind of deflated. Almost immediately. Within uh, less than a minute, it just... And came back to normal. 
And uh, okay, <laughs> all right, Lord, you handled it. I'm no longer. I'm not going to be afraid of that because whatever it was, it was a, a, a enemy coming for the kill. And he, it's like I was saying before in, in a lot of my videos. If you have an open door in some way, Satan has the legal right to attack you in those areas. But fear, perfect love casts out fear. So my trust in the Lord and this is what we all have to do. We have to learn to trust him no matter what it seems like, what it feels like. To put your trust in the Lord because perfect love casts out fear. The only way you can cast out fear is for fear to come to the surface. Okay? In order for fear to come to the surface, you've got to be attacked. Because if you're not attacked in those areas, you're never going to know that fear is there. It's, it remains buried. It lies buried in your heart and your soul until it's forced to the surface. And this is what was happening. Satan was coming in for attack. The fear was coming to the surface. And I had a choice. I had a choice. I could say, oh, no, Jesus is not going to be there to protect me. Or I could take care of myself. Or Jesus, you take care of it. I'm going to let you do this. I My heart is racing. But I'm not the one who's, 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 who's got to fight back here. I'm not the one who has to do the fighting. You are, because you, I'm your bride, you're my bridegroom, you're my, you're the, you're the um, protector, you're, you're the one who, who makes sure that I'm safe, so I have to learn that, I have to learn to be that rest, that, that, that bride that knows she's secure in the arms of her bridegroom, okay, so I had a very, like I said, it was very, very intense, so Whatever it might, it might have some, some spiritual manifestation or physical manifestation, but whatever it was, it was wild. It was wild. Okay. So it, it made that Jesus had actually staved off an attack that was say, Satan was staging against us. That was getting ready to happen. Or it was some attack that Satan had already done or something big that we have already, that we're going to overcome. That we're not going to be afraid of. It's not going to overcome us in the in the in the physical realm. So, just be mindful of that and watch out for that. But just think about it. What's coming up right now is the sacrifice of red heifer. The weekend or the rough sacrifice of red heifer is in that. It's supposed to be this weekend or next weekend or something. Anyway. Just saying that something very interesting is happening. Now, something did cross my mind, and I might as well talk about it briefly. My very curly hair looks different in this light. I really love my curly hair, I tell you the truth. Tell you, I love, I love, I love, I love my curly hair. I wore it straight for so long and, you know, permed it and stuff. And I didn't even know my hair was this curly. I was just thought it was kinky and kinky and dry and brittle it is dry and brittle i have very dry brittle fragile hair there's there's something on youtube that you know i watch these these hair shows the hair videos about hair tutorials and stuff watch a lot of them because i find them fascinating i guess i love i love anything that has to do with hair anyway um what was i saying oh they they have this these these um categories for hair types you know 1a 2B, 3C, and everyone complains, complains about having these 3C hair and 4B and 1A and whatever. They come, everyone, nobody likes their own hair. Let's just, let's face it. Everyone's always complaining about their own hair. Oh, I wish my hair was straighter. I wish my hair was curlier. I wish my hair was blonder. I wish my hair was redder. I, I mean, we all have complaints, okay? So. <laughs> there was, they category, categorize their hair in this, this, this system. And I always say, well, I'm not sure what my hair is, what my hair type is. If it's anything, if they, in, according to their categories, I guess it would be eight, two, one, two, two, three, three, three C, and then four A, four C. Four C is the kinkiest hair type. I think my hair is probably, if it's categorized, probably three C. Just saying, three A, three, three C, four A, something like that. But I, I think to myself, it's not any of those things. Cause my hair really is three F. My hair is 3F. Well, what's 3F? Fine, frizzy, fragile. Fine, frizzy, fragile hair. That's my hair. 
Anyway, all that to say, I'm really starting to learn how to love and appreciate my hair. It's got its own character, that's for sure. And it is delicate, that's for sure. And uh, but anyway, I'm 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 really loving it right now. I have to tell you, this new modern, you know, style for women of color who have this frizzy hair, and uh, you know they got this new styling method of you know leaving conditioner and styling gel and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, it leaves my hair really really curly, and I love it. Love my hair. I love my hair like this. I really really appreciate it. Plus, it's so easy to take care of. Love it. Anyway. I know I'm going off topic. Anyway, all I, one thing I wanted to bring up, something I want to talk about briefly, just if I can, briefly, because you know my videos have a tendency not to be brief. I start out thinking I'm going to be a brief, I'm going to be a brief video, and then it ends up being three hours long. Uh, I may as well sit through a movie. Okay. <laughs> okay. What was going through my mind, I was thinking about Esther and Vashti. <coughs> And Leah, and Martha, and Mary. Actually, let me just. Uh, this is kind of hard for me because it's like I said, it's my orientation's all wrong here. Martha, let's go with Martha. Martha, I wanted to. Uh oh, I made a mistake. Okay. Um, the story of Martha and Mary are very. Is, I, I was just thinking about what an interesting, an interesting, um, oh, an interesting parallel about the difference between Martha and Mary compared to the virgins, those who are religiously minded, and to the bride, which is like a Mary, who is spiritually minded. Um, and the difference between them is so evident in the way Jesus deals with both Martha and Mary. Now, I want to just go there for a second. Luke, in the verse, in the chapter of Luke, in the story of Martha and Mary, you always think of Martha, you always think of Martha. Martha and Mary. Martha, Martha Stewart, you know, Martha was always busy with her hands and cooking this and planting that and doing this and doing that. She was a doer, um, very faithful oriented type of person. This is what a Martha is. And a Martha is a lovely person. We need Marthas in this world. But the difference between Martha and Mary is a kind of a, the difference between uh, Leah and Rachel in a sense, in, in the same thing that Leah and Rachel represents law. Um, those who are religiously oriented and those who are spiritually oriented. Martha and Mary are the same type. Martha is a religiously oriented person and Mary is a spiritually oriented person. Now listen to this. It says, Luke 10, 38. Now it came to pass as they went the aunt, that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she and her sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Um, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me serve to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. I, I love that. Martha, 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 Martha. It's, it's, uh, it's, what is it? Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> Martha, Martha. Thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen the good, that good part which shall not be taken away from her. I, I, I love this illustration. I love this illustration because... It shows the difference between those who have a religious spirit, a religious-minded person, a religious-minded woman, who is troubled. She's not at rest in her spirit. She's, she's cumbered about. This is what Jesus says, cumbered. She was cumbered. 
And she's she becomes the accuser of her sister. She accuses her sister of being lazy, of, of not doing her part. She's not working hard enough. She's not doing the works that I'm doing. And, and you, you better, you tell her to do what I'm doing. You, 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 you go after her. <laughs> so she was, she wanted the discipline. She wanted her, she was judging her sister and just wanting her to be disciplined for, you know, and chastised for not, for not being as cumbered about things and worried and fussing and screwing about doing this, that, and the other thing. That's not what Martha was doing was a bad thing. She was trying to serve food. She was trying to be helpful. But she wasn't understanding that sitting at Jesus' feet, the master, Jesus, was there in her house. And there was a very rare opportunity to listen to the voice of God. And she was worried about this and that, and this and that, and why is why isn't Mary helping me? Why did the, the you get after her? You do that is a religious spirit. She's religiously minded. Okay, so that is the difference between the virgins and the bride. The bride is sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's she wants to be in communication and relationship. She wants to listen. She wants to hear the heart of God. She is, that is about her. She's in love with Jesus, okay? And there's Martha worried about the world. Worried about what other people think. Worried about what other people are doing, what they're not doing. This is what a religious spirit-minded person does and thinks like, okay? Now, so the same thing with the story of Leah and Rachel. Leah, Leah wanted to be the, the one in you know, she is she was her right to be married first. She's the eldest. She goes after daddy, daddy, you take care of the situation. You know, you know better than anybody. This is the law. The law says this, and the law says that. We you know, how dare Rachel, who does she think she is? She's my younger bitch sister. How does she think that she can lord it over me by having a husband before I am? So she is a religiously minded person. And her children end up with that spirit. Okay? Now Rachel's not without fault. Okay, she represents the bride travailing and birth. She's travailing, but she also has problems. She, she, she steals her, 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 her uh, father's idols and sits on them. Okay, to disguise the fact that she was the one who um, sat on, she stole the idols. So she's got some problems to work through. Okay, another thing is that's interesting, I think, about the whole thing is that, um, so she's got a spiritual problem. Rachel's got the spiritual problem of working through spiritual matters um and it's 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 uh leah who's religiously minded she's religious and she is legalistic okay um and in the meantime also uh, it, i think it's interesting how rachel is the one who says she has she gets the surrogate first she brings in a, um, a servant her bondsmaid into the situation and she she gives bilhah gives birth to dan she names him Dan and says, the Lord will judge me. And Dan, of course, represents the snake in the middle of the road. He is the one who, he's the judge. He's, he's like he's like the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. That that stops your progress, that, that can hinder you in your in your travels and in your walk and your journey. And that's what Satan does. He, Satan is our, the hinderer and the, and the, the uh, accuser of who? The brethren, those who are in Christ Jesus. The tribulator, he's the tribulator. So he's he's um. It's like so. Dan was put in Rachel's path, and she says, "I'm going to be judged. I'm being judged by God by having this child, by having allowing Dan to be born into this world. He, I'm going to be judged." So Rachel knew that that meant that she was going to be now judged through this this decision that she's made. And the same thing with the church. Now that we've come to Christ. We're being judged by the synagogue of Satan. And their job is to tribulate us, to be a hindrance in our road in order to what? To sanctify us. Okay? So it's a very interesting parallel. Now, so there's one, there's a difference between Leah and Rachel. Again, one is religiously minded, and one is more spiritually minded. The one that's chosen, of course, the one who brings forth the chosen fruit, the promised child, is Rachel. Okay? And we, the bride, will also bring forth the chosen child, the child, the, the promised child. We are children promised when we are born of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we, that's what 
Acts 2, uh, the sermon of the premier sermon of Peter to the people was you will become the, the promised child when you accept Jesus Christ and are baptized. You become part of his promise. And Rachel brought forth the promised child and also the bride will bring forth the promised child. So therefore, they see what goes around comes around. Then I was thinking about Leah and Rachel. I was thinking about how Leah, I mean, how, uh, not Leah, excuse me, Esther and Vashti. Esther, Esther and Vashti. Esther, uh, Vashti was the one who had the legalistic spirit. She was beautiful, but she was legal. She was rich. She, she was legalistic. She, she, she was told to come to wearing her crown into the banquet. And she said, I'm not doing it. It's not lawful. It's not, it's not correct. It's not correct for me to come into your, your banquet where you guys are all drunk, you know, and I've got too much dignity for dignity for that. I, I can't be doing that. No, there's people who say, well, he was telling her to come naked and wear a crown and wear nakedness before, for the men, but he was drunk because he was, so he wasn't in, the correct, in his correct mind. But if that was the case, then of course that is understandable. She could have come still clothed, wearing a crown and said, sorry, hon, I'm coming to the banquet, letting you know this is not right. Okay. Or she could have handled it differently. I don't know how she could have, but whatever, wherever it was, her attitude was one of pride, one of, um, to, you know, no, no, you, you don't understand the law. I'm better than you. I'm greater than you. I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. It's not lawful. It's not right. It's not you. You're just a drunk. You know. So basically, her attitude was quite prideful. I was trying to say she's very religious and very proudful. So here is uh, um, the situation between her and Esther. Esther comes to the situation. She knows she's got to go into the throne room. She doesn't want to go into the throne room. He's the, the king's not drunk. <laughs> He's in his right mind. He's sober. And she's got to go in there and barge into that situation. But she comes clothed beautifully. She knows that she's got to make an impression. She's only got one chance. Okay? She's only got one chance. So she's going to break the law. She's going to have to be humble in herself. She's going to have to go in there and present herself in hopes that she's going to receive grace. Okay? So it's, she has... She has a different spirit that goes in be presented before the king. And this is what our king is looking for. He's looking for, first of all, bravery. It, you have to be brave. doesn't mean that you're not without fear to some extent, because I'm sure Esther had some fear, but she also knew who she was. She was the child of the king, a ch child of God. She was a child of God from the tribe of Benjamin. She knew who she was. Okay. And that God had a plan and she was put in this position for a purpose. Just like the church is put into the temple for a time such as this. Our, t our task is not for judgment. Our t task is to petition Jesus. Just like the Holy Spirit petitions the Father on our behalf, our job as the wife of the king is to petition Jesus on behalf of our people. OK, and so but our job is not to go in there with pride because we, we come from humble origins. We don't have, you know, prestigious backgrounds and pedigree and all that sort of stuff that we can say, hey, I, I come from so it's just such and such a line, such and such and such. No, we are, we're, we're dogs, people. <laughs> we came from humble origins. And yet we were lifted up and given a crown for the purpose of serving in the temple. I mean, that should cause us to have some sense of humility. And that's what happens with Esther. She comes into the, the throne room knowing that she is breaking the law and she is depending on the grace of the king to extend his, his scepter to her. And he does. And he does. And he's pleased, so pleased. He says, I'll give you up to half. But what is your petition? <laughs> you're so beautiful and you're so brave. And uh, man, I, I forgot how lovely you were. It's been such a long time since I saw your pretty face. And now I'm really remembering how wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. What is it you want? I'd give you up to half my kingdom. Now, he might have been just, you know, half hearted saying it, but he still said it. He said it three times to her. Three times he says it's true. That's a very interesting thing that he says something three times. Just like Jesus says things three times to people, like he said to Peter. P 
Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me, Peter? And Peter says to him, I phileo you, Lord. And then Jesus says to him a second time, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, I phileo you. You must know I phileo you. Then he says it a third time. Peter, but instead of saying agape, he says, Peter, do you phileo me? Which is why the church of Philadelphia is in the likeness of Peter. He's the premier apostle. We, You can come to the Lord with phileo love and he will accept you. Jesus will accept you with phileo love. Even if you don't agape him, you have to have at least phileo love for the Lord. Okay, But he will agape you back until you agape him back. He loved us first, we love him back. And then we learn to love him as he loved us. That's just the way it works, okay? So and it's interesting. So he says, um, so um, he says that to him three times. Now he Lord said to me three times, I must choose my bride from among the daughters of men. He said to me three times. So anyway, what I'm just trying to say is that that he says that the king says to Esther three times. You know, the first time, my old man, you know, uh, hey, you're beautiful. I'm glad you came in. Good to see you. What is it you want? I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. Yeah, you know, it's just you know for everybody to hear because I'm that generous. I want everyone to think I'm just that generous because, you know, it's the protocol. So Esther says, no, 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 it's okay. I just want you to come for a ban- banquet. I don't need your half of your kingdom. That's okay. <laughs> so he says, okay, well, so that sounds easy enough to handle. So he goes to the banquet with, Haman, and then he uh, then he asks them okay, after this wonderful meal. He's curious. <laughs> he, he knows this is more than just about a banquet. He knows there's something brewing, but he can't put his finger on it. So he says again, uh, "What is it you want? I'll give you up to half my kingdom." Now there's a little bit more emphasis on this. I'm sure there's more more emotion behind it, more reality. Really, Esther, what is it you? What's going on here? And this keeps him up at night <laughs> so much he can't sleep. So they send him, um, he, sends, they, he sends for the, the, the scribe to bring him, you know, something to read or, you know, read, have be read to. And then they read about Mordecai. <laughs> and so he's got to take care of that situation. When he goes back into the banquet, the, the, the second banquet with Esther, what does he say? Really, Esther, what is it? I'll eat, I'm so, you know. I really need to know. I'll even give you up to half of my kingdom. Really, I want to solve your problem. I know you've got a problem, so I want to solve it for you. And that's when it all comes out. Okay? <laughs> this is a funny thing. I was like, well, I haven't sent it to Jesus in a long, long time. But when this first all started to me, for me, this is about 14 years ago now, um, one of the things I used to say to him, you know, I, I, um, I think the Lord actually used to would say to me, he would say, you know, I would give you up to half my kingdom. And I would say to him, <laughs> I'll take the half you're in. <laughs> okay, I'll take the half you're in. That's the half I want. And that amused him. <laughs> you know, I could I could hear him giggling about that. And maybe he'd ask me again just to hear me say, I'll take the half you're in. Okay, Done. <laughs> Anyways, all that to say. So something, just and just something that I thought was rather something that was going on in my mind. Something I was thinking about the difference between someone who thinks like a virgin with a religious judgmental spirit and those who think like a bride. Okay, those who think like with this the judgmental spirit and those who think like virgin and a bride. There is a difference. Okay. Uh, one other thing I was thinking about, actually, one before I finish, one more thing about Martha and Mary that I thought was rather interesting uh, is when Jesus wept, John, in the book of John chapter 11, There is a difference in the way Jesus talks to Martha and Mary and their relationship is very, is even evident in the raising of Lazarus. Um, not that I think of it. So Jesus, Mary's the one who anointed Jesus with her, with her hair. 
and what she broke costly oil and anointed Jesus. So there is that. It's a beautiful sacrificial love of the spirit of Mary. And I'm talking about to you about of the spirit of Mary. It's very very important. Jesus's mother's name was Mary. Women who surrounded Jesus were Mary. You never hear the name Mary before the New Testament. And Jesus seems to surround him and seem to be drawn to women who, who have that name, at least were named around him. There must have been lots of other women who had the name, different names. But it's the Marys that are mentioned. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. It's important to understand that Jesus is looking for the spirit of Mary in his bride. Okay? So it's Mary who anoints Jesus with her with his hair, preparing him for his burial. Um, so he's here's here's um, Jesus, Jesus hears about Lazarus being sick to death, and he waits until he's dead. And so they go. He goes to Martha and Mary's house and uh, out to their place where they live. And um, Lazarus has died, and he's in the tomb. And uh, see, let me see where I can find it here. Is this, uh, where is it now? I want to go to. So this just I'm just discombobulated because I can't use my left hand, and I'm twisting. No, that's not that's not good. Ah. Uh, John eleven seventeen, and when Jesus came, he found that that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh into Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off, and many of, the, many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went in and met him, and Mary sat still in the house. Then said Mary, Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. But I know even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask, God will give it to thee. Jesus said unto her, thou, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha is a very faithful woman. She's lovely. She's truly a lovely woman. And she obviously had a great faith in Jesus. But what she, I don't know what she really is asking here. She says, Whatever thou ask, you will done. She's, she, because she doesn't, she doesn't ask Jesus to raise her brother from the dead. But I'm not really sure what she's asking for, because listen to her her response to uh, Jesus when he, he tells her that his thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So I don't know whether she was actually expecting Jesus to rise, raise Lazarus from the dead, because it's been four days. And so I'm not really sure what she was ex asking from Jesus. You know, I'm not really sure. Um, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which shall come into the world. Okay. So, he, he needs her, he needs her, her, her faith. Uh, Mar Martha's faith is very important, so so that's that's important. But her faith is one of resurrection for the last day. The resurrection for the last day is the day of judgment. Okay, when the books of life are open, that is the, what a religious spirit is expecting. A religious spirit says, God will resurrect the dead, but on the last day, on the day of resurrection, which is um, the day of judgment, when the bema seat. In book, you know, the book of life and the book of dead are open, which of course happens after the millennial reign. Of course, I don't, I don't think they even knew that there was going to be a millennial reign. I don't know whether that was actually recorded anywhere in the Old Testament. So the religious spirit or the spirit of, of the uh, law expects to be raised from the dead, but not until the day of judgment, which is the very last day of humanity or the millennial reign when Christ opens the books. Okay. So that's what a religious-minded person would think. Now, the two different things happen here. And so um, John eleven twenty eight, Mary comes into the, the picture. And when she said so, she went her way 
and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, the master is come and calleth for thee. Okay, so now, now, now that Jesus has spoken to Martha, he's gotten her, her faith on the situation. He's got her, her expectations. Now he's calling for Mary. Mary has now, Mary, the spirit of Mary comes into the picture. Okay, so Jesus does nothing about raising Lazarus nor does he do any whatever. I don't know what it is. Like I said, Martha is expecting from Jesus because she, as far as she was concerned, the last day, Lazarus wasn't going to receive his resurrection until the last day. And so what? So he does nothing. <laughs> so Jesus does nothing. Then the spirit of Mary comes into the picture. Jesus, Mary who anointed Jesus with oil or is going to anoint Jesus with oil, or has anointed Jesus with this oil, she comes into the picture. The spiritual bride, the spiritual woman, comes into the picture. And when she said so, she went away and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet known, come, not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And the Jews which were with her in the house comforted her and comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goes unto the grave to weep there. Then Mary was come to Jesus, was, and saw him, and fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if thou had been there, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And when he and he said, "Where have you laid him?" and they said unto him, "Lord, come and see." Jesus wept. So here is to a very interesting picture of a woman who was very faithful and a good woman, Martha, that had a religious spirit and so therefore didn't have the faith nor the expectation for Jesus to do anything in the situation as it was. Okay. So then here comes Mary. She has a spiritual spirit and she, she says she's, she's weeping and Jesus is experiencing her torment. He's experiencing her pain because his spirit is in connection. So it's like just when Mary sat at his feet, she was adoring him and loving him. And that's what he needed from her. And that's what he needs from us. She wept at his feet with the expectation you know, my brother wouldn't have died, but now she's weeping. And she's like, it's like an Esther moment. Esther is in need. She needs rescuing. And he can't resist it. He can't resist it. And his spirit is communicating with her spirit. It's so much so that he is now weeping, feeling her pain, and then goes and rescues the situation. He does something here. It's a beautiful allegory of Christ and his bride and how Jesus reacts to the religious spirit. He loves Martha, but he's unable to do anything for Martha until the last day. And then you have the spiritual bride, the spiritual woman who cries at his feet, is helpless and, and humble and her tears move him to his tears, to him wanting to rescue her from her pain. Isn't that beautiful? So anyway, so he goes, and then that's when he raises Lazarus from the dead. Beautiful. Beautiful. Anyway, that was on my mind, and that's what I wanted to share. So if I think of anything else that I want to share, I will. But in the meantime, I probably will have to move my computer back to the other side because I'm finding this much too difficult to do. If I could actually use a left-handed mouse and use it properly, <laughs> then this wouldn't be a problem. But like I said, the cursor, I can't seem to change the cursor from pointing this way to the left and get it pointing to the right. You think something so little like that would, wouldn't cause so much problems, but it is. It's causing me a lot of problems, people. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. So God bless, and I will talk to you later.